Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Moose Henderson. I'm a wildlife photographer and today we're going to be talking about photographic composition as it relates to wildlife photography. If you've gone into the bookstore and shopped the photographic section you've undoubtedly seen a few books on composition and if you watch a few YouTube videos of, of various YouTubers who do photographic type videos you'll notice quite a few of them are doing classes, paid classes on composition. But few of these classes cover wildlife photography. And the reason for that is wildlife photography is a bit more complicated than is landscape photography. With landscape photography, you can show up before the sun starts to set, uh, kind of plan where you want the trees and the mountains and things like that. The trees and the mountains aren't going to move unless it's blowing like stink. And so this makes it a little bit easier when you're doing landscape photography. With wildlife photography, of course the background is not going to move very much unless you have wind blowing like stink again. But the animal itself is constantly on the move. It's turning its head from side to side, it's raising its ears, it's lowering its ears. Uh, you may have one or more animals in the scene which would complicate things. And so composition in wildlife photography tends to be a bit more complicated. In this video I'm going to split it up into uh, three different videos because there's quite a bit to cover. And we'll go over the basic guidelines or what some people call rules of composition. I don't believe there is any rules in photography but uh, I didn't make up the names, so we'll stick with the names that are established. And after we go over these guidelines or rules, then we'll actually look at a couple of photographs and see how we can put these rules or guidelines into practice with our wildlife photos. So let's get started. Hi there, we're back. So first let's do a basic definition of composition. Composition is basically where you include the elements in your photo that are important, you exclude the elements that are unimportant, and you try to make a balanced and pleasing photograph. A photograph that your eye leads into and that you're able to see the primary subject without searching around very much. We've all seen photos in the past that you look at and there are a lot of distracting sticks or grasses and things like that that really don't add to the photograph at all. So part of composition is knowing what to include and what not to include and then how to orient these various elements in your scene. Probably the most common guideline for photographic composition is known as the rule of thirds. And this is where you take your photograph or as you look through the back of the camera and you draw imaginary lines, two of them that are vertical and two of them that are horizontal. And this cuts the picture up into thirds going vertically and horizontally. And then each place where these thirds cross are called power points. And the lines themselves are lines of interest. So if you put your subject at one of these power points, it's going to be more compelling than if you put your subject dead center. Now that's pretty easy with landscapes because landscapes you can choose to put a mountain peak or the Eiffel Tower or whatever, whatever it is that you're photographing 
on one of these thirds, but when you're looking at an animal, the entire animal may fill up the frame. So what do you choose to put on one of these thirds? Well, the eye is the most important thing when you're looking at any photograph, the eye of the animal. So I typically put the nearest eye of the animal on one of these PowerPoints. And that will draw the viewer's attention in and give them a direct connection with the animal. Now, of course, you don't want to cut off parts of the animal in the effort of putting the eye on one of these PowerPoints. Sometimes you may need to move the animal over a little bit in the frame, but if you keep the eye on one of the third lines, it will usually be a much better composition than if you get the eye in the dead center. The next guideline is known as the left to right rule. And basically what this implies is that here in the United States and many other countries, we tend to read from left to right. And so it is thought that the eye looks at a photograph from left to right. Of course, not all countries read from left to right. Uh, Arabic, as I understand, reads from right to left. I think that Chinese letters, if I've uh, heard pe people saying read from top to bottom. But generally speaking, here in the United States, European countries, most Slavic countries, and so on, read from left to right. So when we look at a photograph, we tend to scan from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So it's good in your photographs to kind of lead the viewer through the photo from the left to the right. The third guideline is to isolate your subject. You don't want a lot of distracting elements in your photograph and you want the eye to go immediately to the subject of interest. If, say, you're photographing a moose, then maybe you want to have the moose on one side of the frame and then have some open space on the other side of the frame, or maybe have a tree over here on the other side of the frame to help balance out the moose. But you don't want a bunch of other distracting elements in there if your main focus is the moose. The next guideline is to leave some negative space. You want to give the animal enough room to breathe in the photograph and not fill it so full that it creates a tension where you feel like if the animal was to raise an ear that it would go outside the photograph. So leaving a little bit of space, especially in front of the animal, so the animal has a place to look or maybe has a place to walk or a place to breathe or something like that. A little negative space in your photograph can go a long way to creating a pleasing composition. Leaving negative space relates directly to the next rule, and that's leaving space to move into. If you have an animal that is walking through the frame, you want to leave a little bit of room in front of his face so that you have the feeling in the photograph that the animal can continue to move without hitting the edge of the frame. If you have a bird that is flying and its wings are going up, you want a little bit of room on the side so that the wings have room to expand in the photograph and you don't feel like they'd be clipped if they came up a little bit. If the animal is on one side of the photograph and looking to the other, you want room for the animal to look into the frame as if it's seeing something in the frame. You don't always want to crowd the animal so much that they don't have a sense of, of space, a sense of where to look, a sense of where to move. Having available space in your photograph m makes the photograph look more pleasing, 
and more comfortable and not as much tension. Number six is foreground interest and depth. Now, of course, we said that you don't want to include uh, extraneous elements, but you also don't want to have your animal or your wildlife completely isolated. It's good to have something in the photograph that kind of puts the animal in its place. Maybe a little bit of grass in front of the face, or maybe you have a mountain back behind the animal or something like that, that gives you a sense of depth, that gives you a sense that the animal is part of his environment. I like very much to do what I call animal scapes. And animal scapes is where you have an animal prominent in the photograph, but then you use a very deep depth of field so that the background is completely in focus too. And this puts the animal directly in context of the environment that they're in, such as this bison that is in the Tetons. And you can see the bison is prominent in the front of the frame, but the mountains in the background give a very pleasing background. It helps to balance out this massive bison in the foreground by having this background of mountains and layer of clouds, it helps to make the image much more pleasing. So this covers the six basic rules that we're going to cover today, or guidelines. In the next video, we'll cover more guidelines. But now let's take a look at a number of photographs where we have put these guidelines into play. And you'll notice many times in a photograph, you use more than one guideline. For example, you may use the rule of thirds as to where to put the animal's eye, but then you may have the rule of space to give room in the photograph for the animal to look into. So let's take a look at these photos. The important thing to remember is these compositional guidelines or rules are just that. They're guidelines. They're not meant to be hard and fast rules. In fact, some of them uh, contradict each other. Like rule number three, where we said to isolate the subject, make it the center of interest, kind of uh, contradicts Rule number six, where you want foreground interest and depth, like an animal scape would be. So don't worry about the fact that some of the rules seem to contradict each other. The main thing is to use these rules as guidelines to be able to come up with a pleasing image. And the first one we're going to look at is using the rule of thirds. And with this particular one, we can see we have a bison image here. And I've placed the eyes of the bison on the upper third of the frame. So it kind of focuses your attention on the bison eyes. And then your eyes kind of drift down. And it encounters that big, wet nose of the bison. And then it goes around the frame and you eventually see the horns and stuff like that. But your, your eye, when you first look at this image, is immediately drawn to the eyes of the bison because it's right there on the third line. In fact, the two eyes are almost on the power points of the upper third. And the nose is on the lower third line. This image of the bison also illustrates the concept of isolating your subject. I did not include the feet and most of the rest of the bison because the face is just so powerful in this image that that's what I wanted to focus your attention on. Our next image has a bighorn sheep standing upon a rock cliff with a blue background. And you can see the bighorn sheep is in one of the third power points. So this illustrates 
the rule of thirds and there's also room in front of the bighorn sheep if he wants to run down the mountain so this illustrates the rule of space and it also isolates the subject even though the cliff face and the grass and the background of the blue sky is there the only thing of really of dynamic interest is this bighorn sheep so this illustrates a couple of the concepts pretty well our next image has a pair of foxes and this one illustrates the left to right rule pretty well as you look at this image you tend to go from the small fox on the left hand side and you kind of follow up the diagonal to the fox on the right hand side and this kind of leads your eye through the photograph and makes for a very pleasing image the grass in the foreground and the background is a little bit distracting but not so much so that it ruins the photograph and the last image we'll look at today is this bear in snow and this one illustrates the concept of foreground interest well the grass is right in front of the face kind of frame the face and give you a sense of place for this bear instead of him just being isolated in a snow background it it makes it seem like he belongs there and is just not uh, all by himself he has uh, some interest to the photograph I hope this first part of the composition has has helped you uh, we'll do the second part in our next video and then the third part after that. Composition is a fun thing to do, but it can get a bit overwhelming. But the more that you practice this, the more second nature it becomes. You get on a scene and you see an animal and you immediately think, leave a little room in front of his eyes let me compose it with his face in the upper third let me put the cliff down in the lower third and things like this really do become second nature as you begin to do them more and more if this has been a good video for you please hit the like icon and consider subscribing to our channel I really do appreciate your support and the fact that you were following my journey as I documented in these videos. I will see you again next time, which will be in a couple of days.